right. It's it day. Yeah. I don't know. It's time oh. uh, to talk disease and parasite prevention today. Yeah. Right? Raise your hand if you have never had ick before. I can't raise my hand. No. No. I, personally, I, I haven't had it, but my fish have. Have you treated for ick, brook, velvet, mm -hmm. any of that stuff? Have I treated mm -hmm. personally? No. But I practice man. I practice ick management. Yeah. Now you. Right now. No. You planted. You practiced head in the sand a minute ago. <laughs> uh, I have treated for it and yeah. failed. We're gonna solve that problem. Sweet. Uh, I've, I've, I got the outline worked. Getting the people involved. So yeah. it's coming. Uh, but today, man, what we're gonna talk about is something that I stumbled upon because I think it was just it was so valuable to me. I just like sharing those things uh, with you guys. Yeah. Uh, and it was uh, a particularly interesting thread that I came across from Humblefish called Ick Eradication versus uh, Ick Management. Well so, known and respected in the hobby, for oh, sure. Oh yeah, uh, so probably one of the most respected people in disease and parasite control in, in the reef tanks. There's other ones out there and we'll actually share some of those guys uh, in the future weeks. But yeah. uh, man, this was so valuable to me because once you get into it, we're gonna share a little bit of the, the content there, but we're gonna get right over to all of your guys' comments mm -hmm. on uh, uh, the YouTube as well as hashtag Aspires TV. But I wanna share his article just a little bit and kind of some of the concepts because you are doing one of these three things at home right now. It was a light bulb moment when you read this. So. Yeah, I yeah. am. And yeah. like you are, <laughs> you are doing this whether you know it or not, and then you can decide how like well you're doing it, right? That's true. Uh, so you're either, either practicing ick eradication which means that you make sure it never goes in the tank, or you're practicing ick management means I just kind of accept it's in there and then I manage to that fact, yeah. or I bury my head in the aquarium sand and just like hope for the best. Yeah. You are doing one of those three things, uh, for sure. And I bet you everybody out there can raise their hand and said, I've done all of those at some point in time, or tried, or, or maybe some of you one. probably missed the eradication yeah. thing because it's the hardest one. Yeah. Actually, it isn't hard because we're going to share that a little bit later, too. Yeah. Uh, so this was actually uh, the first comment I wanted to hit on uh, by uh, Stellarfly SBK. Got to say, I love reading articles written by Humble Fish. Super informative. I basically learned how to properly quarantine fish because of his articles, full of no nonsense mm -hmm. advice. Nice find. So if you want to know, man, go to Reef to Reef, uh, search for Humble Fish, search for that thread that we showed, the ick eradication. Inside of there, he'll actually show you how to quarantine your fish and stuff. Yeah. Hot links in there too. So uh, go in there, uh, just one of the best resources. There's a lot of stuff in there. So we want to kind of like, uh, you know, dumb it down, get it into uh, like a typical reefer, reefer language. Right? <laughs> All right. He does get pretty deep. So uh, I wanted to share first what those things are real quick. And so I'm going to read what ick eradication is in his own words. So simply put, this means that you're doing everything possible to keep ick out of your tank. That can be accomplished by establishing and maintaining a strict quarantine protocol outlined here. How to quarantine. There's a link to do it. Uh, it's very important to quarantine each and every fish, including your very first one, if you want to avoid ick. Every fish. All right. Every last fish, including the first one, mm. right? And so for those of you who know, wondering out there, is it really possible to keep ick and velvet and brook and all that kind of stuff out of your tank? The answer is unequivocally yes. The stuff does not, you know, materialize out of thin air. There yeah. isn't a magic ick fairy. Right. Uh, and anybody who is a biologist or, a, you know, like a fish veterinarian of sorts that really dives into this will tell you the same thing. Uh, there's a difference between, you know, the plausibility and possibility, though. Because oh, you really yeah. have to do it well. Yeah, so, was, I mean... You'd have to be. You'd have to keep this at the forefront of your mind for everything. So every single fish that goes in, like what about invertebrates, rocks, coral frag plugs, all Droplets of that of stuff. Droplets of water. Yeah, even yeah. Th there's a section in here where he talks about aerosol and keeping your QT like at least within ten feet away from your display tank because they can become aer aerosolized mm -hmm. and transfer over to your DT. S splash. Yeah. Oh, whatever. Huh. Yeah. So uh, possible, plausible, different things. Plausible if you know what you're doing and you do it right, mm -hmm. right? And so we're going to get to actually in the upcoming weeks here, we're putting together that series on quarantining your fish and stuff. We're going to share it. And so we'll show you how to do it right in a way that if you follow those steps, it is actually plausible. Yeah. Right? All right. So why you'd practice this, uh, once a fish is I infected specimen, as long as there's always fish to feed on, it can survive in the tank almost indefinitely. 
the only ways to get it out is starve it out uh, by allowing the fish to go uh, follow or fishless for 76 days, right? All right, so if you already have ick in your tank, you're gonna have to catch all of your fish to take them all out and uh, treat them. Not something most people wanna do. Yeah. All right, so ick management, this is what most of us are probably doing. It's some kind of combination of actively doing that and just head in the sand. Yeah, right? and if you're conscious that uh, Ick is in your in in your tank. Like you've seen the signs of it on your fish, or at some point in time you do, but it's not really there all the time. And uh, so this is management is like I know it's in there. I've mm -hmm. seen it before. It has every chance of, you know, spiking up uh, at any change or major change or fluctuation in the tank. But I'm just managing my tank with stable parameters, healthy diet, uh, all of these types of things that I'm keeping it at bay. So you know it's in there, but it's not actually causing a problem. Mm. This is a vast, vast, it's almost everybody in the crowd today, raise yeah. your hand, it's probably oh, yeah. you. Uh, some of you, you're saying, no, 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 like do the ick eradication, start helping others, man, because uh, your, your practices are the best ones for mm. sure. All right, so ick management. I'm gonna read what uh, Humblefish says this is. Uh, this method involves just managing the presence of the disease instead of eradicating it. You know you have ick in your tank, you are willing to risk it by for foregoing proper QT. Despite how strongly I advocate for uh, ick eradication these days, I employed ick management for over 30 years. Pro. Right? For 30 years. This is somebody that's mm. on the forefront of this. Factors ick management for 30 years. So this is the biggest deal for me, actually. Hey, yo, what this means is that I shouldn't be ashamed if I don't QT, right? Better yet, you shouldn't shame others, ah, right? True. So like, we go out there and tell everybody proper quarantine is the right way to do it. Always do it, always do it. And if you don't, you're a bad reefer. Well, I mean, I don't know. Maybe that's true, maybe it isn't. But at the same time, man, like we have to acknowledge the elephant in the room that almost nobody actually does it. Like very few people do it even fewer people do it well. That's true, right? yeah. So even, uh, that's what my favorite part of this whole article is actually just acknowledging that, man, he too had done this uh, ick management, uh, but eventually after 30 years evolved, mm -hmm. right? So like, I don't know, I just, like most of the people in the room don't wanna be shamed about their fish and their habits, right? So like, that's just super important. Yeah, there's a few, uh, there's a few cases, like in the comments that we'll read today, there's a few other people that have done the same thing. Like at some point in their reefing career, something has happened to where they now practice eradication instead of just management. And probably for a lot of them, it comes at like a loss of, ta of fish, oh, uh, just, you do it because of catastrophic loss. Yeah, I yeah. mean, I will. If, once you lose every single fish in your display, or almost all of them, it's that, and you go, I will never do this again without ick eradication. You only up your game in reefing when you like run into the problems everybody told you you were going to. Very <laughs> few true. of us uh, are wise enough to listen to those that came before us. Be one of those people. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> That's true. But yeah, you usually only up your game. So how do so, we do management? So he has got four things in here we're just going to touch on, then we're going to get to you guys' comments and share all, all of the information that you guys have as well. Uh, but the first one is four ways to manage uh, ick in your tank. So this is active ick management, meaning that you're likely to hopefully make sure that even though it's in the tank, you actually never see the signs of it. Never, certainly never wipes out the whole tank. Yeah. All right. So utilizing the best UV sterilizer you can fit or afford, while UV will never zap all the free swimmers, it will keep their numbers down so the fish can better cope with the ones remaining. A diatom filter can also be used to remove the free, free swimmers. So this is an important part, you know, and I changed my own opinion on this a little bit yeah. over the last year, is used to say, you know, a lot of people would say you can't really treat ick in a tank with a UV sterilizer because it's already on the fish. That's you, actually wrong. Well, so the difference between treatment and cure, right? right. Eradication. Eradication you can't do with a UV sterilizer on its own or probably just a, you know, a combination of UV sterilizer with something else mm -hmm. if you're practicing eradication. So if you know the life cycle of the ick, it doesn't just live on the fish and just like spread and replicate itself on the fish and you can never get it off mm -hmm. with a UV sterilizer. What will happen is they feed off the fish and then they drop off, go down to the sand where they replicate into hundreds or thousands and then go swimming around afterward, hatch and go swimming around for new fish to attack. 
if we sterilize the water, we can capture tons of them before, them before they ever get to the fish, right? So even if you have an active ick outbreak, if you implemented UV like today, and the fish weren't like on their deathbed, you can actually reduce the total amount of parasites in the tank and help it. So ick management is partially reducing the total volume yeah. or number of, of parasites in the tank. Yeah, if there's less potential for bugs to get on me, then I'm less likely to show signs of bugs on me. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's obvious once you yeah, hear it out loud that that is You're not gonna get them all, but a lot of them. The one, the one thing is definitely getting the right size and, and plumbing it right and all those things as yeah. well. All right, all right, so the next one though is boost your fish's immune systems through proper nutrition. This means feeding a wide variety of live and frozen nutritious foods, not just flake and pellets. Feed nori that is loaded with vitamins. Also uh, soak fish food in vitamin supplements such as Celcon, Zocon, Vitachem to further enhance your health. Omega-3 and uh, 6 fish oils are great and cheap soaking alternatives. I imagine he's talking about omega-3 and 6 fish oils from like, uh, like a health food store. Yeah, probably. Yeah, so uh, when you talk about cheap. Form. So, hey, this is the nutrition part, yes. right? So a, a, you know, any organism that has a, a proper diet is way better able to fight off you know, disease and parasites. Right. End of story. Yeah, even humans, uh, if you follow that, uh, mm -hmm. your immune system is much better too. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, it's, it's interesting that like, early on when I first started the hobby, these conversations about the nutrition, uh, really, they were out there, people were having them, but it wasn't something that has been at the forefront of our conversation in the hobby. But it feels like the last, last two years, last couple of years or so, we've been really focusing more heavily on fish nutrition. Well, we just upper game. Yeah. You know, you learn and you upper game. So like for me, you know, I fed mice and shrimp almost exclusively in the beginning. I just had a lot of success with that. Yeah. I was happy with it. So in some ways though, like, you know, I ask people this all the time, like, how long could you live on a pure diet of McDonald's? <laughs> probably a really long time. You probably could, you yeah. sustain. I mean, you got cheese, You'll you live. got meat, you got carbohydrates, <laughs> five vitamin in there somewhere. So I, I could probably live like just that. I mean, I wouldn't be happy, healthy. No. I'd probably get sick a lot, but I could probably eat that three meals a day for decades mm. and survive. Survive. Yeah. It survived the like <laughs> standard that we're looking for. And if I encountered like, uh, you know, I'd probably get sick a lot more often mm. and end of story. Mm. Uh, if, especially if you're looking at like a total scope of this room did that and that, this one I definitely got sicker. Okay, right? yeah. Uh, all right, so, you know, think about your nutrition. You know, there's tons of ways to do it. You know, you can feed varied foods. And one of the things that like a lot of people try to do, and we talked about this a little bit last week was, like I'm trying to feed varied foods and healthy and frequently. Uh, and it's like, I got 80 different products. Yeah. Well, or I can just buy a food that's already varied. You True. know, Rod's food was yep. a good one. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, I think Akari makes like a reef carnivore mm -hmm. mix or something yep. like that. Uh, and you, you can make a do it yourself food really cheap. So, yeah. you know, it doesn't have to like break the bank and it doesn't have to be complex and you don't have to have tons of stuff, but you can think about it, and the more thought you put in it, probably the more successful your ick management process will be. Yeah. This one is also, this one's gonna fight the DNA of every reefer here uh, possible, mm. number three here, because you just want what you want and people just tend to take risks. I've done it, you've done it, mm. all of you done it. So uh, stay on top of your aquarium husbandry. Maintain pristine water quality or conditions, stable parameters and avoid fish that are likely to fight. Poor water quality, fluctuating parameters, aggression from other fish may stress out fish, lower the immune system, and make them more susceptible to parasitic infection. Yes. This is the this is the overarching uh, you know way to win in a reef tank is stability. Uh, talk about it. It's not just for the corals in the tank, uh, the fish also, mm -hmm. especially in in terms of uh, ick management. So mm -hmm. I'm not just uh, I'm not just maintaining stable parameters so that my uh, my corals thrive. But those little fluctuations in salinity, those fluctuations in water temperature, if, my, if I'm not watching my heater and it goes super cold or super hot, uh, it, the salinity goes off because I have a, a leak and my ATO is going. All of those can probably spike or spur like a, an ick outbreak. That's actually one of the things he hits on in the article somewhere is that you know, ick management works. 
No, it doesn't. Right? <laughs> yeah. And we've seen it here, actually. We had uh, an Achilles tang that we had, had uh, thought we'd quarantined well. We put it into a frag system it was in, mm. and it was living there just fine. Achilles tang is like known for uh, ick, to the point that a lot of people won't even buy them anymore because they are yeah. so prone to it. Uh, and actually, we did a pretty good job, and like it was really healthy, we thought until the heaters turned off for the weekend, oh, right? right? And yeah. we came back, he's just covered in ick, and it might have actually been velvet, sometimes it's hard to tell, uh, but he died, Yeah. right? And uh, it, you know, it was just one event, you know? So one power outage, one broken power head, one anything can cause a stressful event that just changes the whole thing, explodes the population in the tank, especially if you're not running UV or anything, one fish, you know, can, you know, all of a sudden one stressed out fish can drop off tons of those little, uh, you know, uh, babies and they will, you know, replicate into hundreds and thousands and then just keep the cycle up. And you have nothing preventing that from happening right. other than healthy fish. But this one is like breeding the populations to attack the rest of the fish. Mm. All right. So, uh, and so the part I wanted to get out here is actually also don't like add so many of the same fish. If you're doing ick management, like really think about husbandry and not you know getting fish that you know full well are going to chase each other as they're around and attack each other forever right, right. because you're probably just going to create a problem for yourself sometime. So this is the same. Next one is real similar to that. The fourth one, most important probably, avoid choose your fish wisely. Avoid ick magnets. Uh, fish with thin mucus coats such as tanks, clown, such as tanks. Clownfish, antheas, wrasses, and mandarins are better choices as they have thick slime coats protecting their skin from attacking parasites. Only buy from reputable sources and don't buy fish that look sick, diseased, damaged, won't eat, or share water with other diseased fish. Okay, choose your fish wisely. You're doing ick management here. If you see a fish in the store that has ick on it, it's time to skip. Yeah. Uh, just move on. And if it looks like it's sharing the water, man, like it's time to, why are you going to introduce that into your own tank? Yeah, unless I actively have a solution for the opposite, the, the ick eradication. I mean, sometimes I might go choose a sick fish because he might be cheap, uh, but I know I already have the system in place to uh, quarantine him properly, medicate him properly before putting it into my system. But if I don't have all, any of that in place, I'm not going to choose a sick fish. I'm going to go one step farther here. Uh. Uh, if the store is willing to sell you a fish that has ick on it uh, and mm. doesn't say, hey, this has ick, here's a treatment method, and knows that you're capable of doing it, uh, skip that store entirely. If they see it, they know what it looks like. Yeah. If they're willing to sell that to you, they're not caring about you or your tank. Mm. And there's probably somebody in your city that actually does, so go check them out. Uh, and it's also, if they do care, and they won't, that's the right person for you as yeah. well. I can't so sell it's you the this opposite. Fish. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty In great. fact, they're the most likely to be able to, you know, treat the fish. All the best people I know in treating fish work or have worked in stores or wholesalers because they see so many of this and saving the fish is actually net profit. Yeah. Right? For them. So they have a financial <laughs> reason to learn this and they learn it through hundreds of fish a day, you know. Yeah. So uh, in that case, I think that there's some of the best opportunities. So just look out for that. But also the other part in here is the ick magnet fish, you know? And so some of you might not know why or whatnot, but the powder blues, powder browns, yep. Achilles tangs, yep. uh, like hippo tanks, something All like my that. favorite ones. Yeah. <laughs> they are, they're all my favorite ones and they seem to be the ick management ones. And I've had, I've had one of each of those except for the Achilles and I, every single one of them has had ick. Some of them I've been able to serve, uh, some of them I've been able to manage and others it was just too far gone. Yeah. Uh, so here's the deal is most of these fish are gonna come with ick or be exposed to it in your tank. They have super thin mucus coats and it's just way easier for the parasite to uh, you know, attack it. And that's kinda of hits on that like immune system. You know, if, you're, if a fish is really healthy, it probably has a really thick mucus coat mm -hmm. or thicker. There's just a lot of things that go into being healthy that help you know, fight off disease, right? But some of these fish just naturally have this. And so when you say, you know what, I just am who I am and I want to kill these tang, I'm going to do it because, <laughs> right? And we've all, you know, done something similar at some point in time. Yeah. Uh, or you have it and learn from us, right? Learn from our mistakes and don't do it yourself. But if I threw that fish in here right now, I'm putting all the other fish in here at risk. And then like and with a, some of the times, I, not just at risk, I'm going to call it really high risk, yeah. you know, when you have an established tank, especially because the fish that are, if I threw in a, an Achilles tang in here, 
the other tanks in here are going to harass it for sure, stress it out, and then it's just going to you know, skyrocket. Yeah, exactly. Yep. All right. So avoid those fish. Uh, if you're just going to practice quarantine management, it's not a good idea. Low, low success rates. And then the last one, there's a fifth thing in here about garlic. And I'll just share with you, it didn't sound like he believed in garlic. Not many of the like pro reefers really do, other than as an attractant. Sometimes you'll get people, fish that don't want to eat to eat. Yep. All right. So there's some pros and cons. I go read that article. But what I really want to get at today now is a lot of you guys' comments. You know, hopefully you understand now the difference between ick management and uh, ick eradication a little bit. If you don't, or, go look into it. And what we didn't talk about is those are the, the head in the sand. So we talked oh. about ick management. We talked about ick eradication. Who's the people in the, the with their head in the sand? As me for the first few years. <laughs> yeah, right? I don't sure. even know where I learned. You know, oh. I, I mean, really, I, I like... Uh, a couple months ago when I came across this thread for the first time it was like where the light bulb went off for me for the mm. first time. Like, mm. you know what? I'm either going to put my head in the sand and just not care and hope for the best. It's all just a gamble in luck, yeah. right? A, that it's going to work, and B, that no stressful event's ever going to come and mess up my luck, right? Yeah. And, or, I'm probably not going to like strip all the, in this case, these were all pre-quarantined fish, you mm -hmm. know, but it, like pretend they weren't and, yeah. and they look healthy. I'm not going to go watch this video and strip all these fish out of here in the whole quarantine. To, yeah. Nobody would do that. Right, right, like, right. I don't know. If any of you would do that, I'd be shocked. So you might have had your head in the sand until you learned about ick management and eradication. And now that I know about ick management and I already haven't done eradication on the fish I have, now I'm going to practice management going forward. Mm -hmm. So that means that I could go and do these four things. I could just like watch my fish, don't stress them out, you know, put in some redundancies to make sure that like you know the tank doesn't go cold or mm -hmm. whatnot, mm -hmm. or get overheated. Feed, uh, you know, f feed appropriately and consistently. You know, I'd say you know varied diet or inclusive diet, which means uh, varied things all in one. You know, type right. of food. Right, right, right. So any of those things, I would do that with your own tank that you have right now but it's really about what I do with the next tank, or if I have like very obvious signs of disease in my tank and I need mm. to do something about it, that's another story. All right, so uh, starting with YouTube here, uh, and we YouTube, we had just a poll a little bit about UV, so there's just like a few comments about UV that we throw in here, yeah. and then we're gonna get over to, the, over to Facebook. So I'll let you hit the first one. All right, so from YouTube, Mr. Hyde, 14537. Uh, I think it could help, uh, he's talking about UV, UV here. I think it could help with cloudy water from bacterial blooms, algae, et cetera, but not so much with actual parasites like ick. So this is actually one of the more interesting things that has happened to me mm. in the last couple of weeks. This is a pretty common thought process that I kind of grew up in reefing in that, yeah. you know, it doesn't really work on ick, you know, or it doesn't mm -hmm. really work on, you know, fish parasites or whatever, even though like every you know, fish wholesaler, you aquarium, know, public uh, aquarium. Yeah, how you use it. massive uh, UV sterilizers. The only thing I chalk it up to is you're using bad ones or not improv properly installed. The flow rate wasn't right, or mm. who knows? Who Toys knows? instead of tools. It's a hard thing to like to definitively say one right. way or the other, but we know for sure that turning the UV on is going to reduce the free swimmers in there. And because it's happening like multiple times an hour, yeah. and, you know, and the things have week long rep, uh, reproductive cycles, it's probably very effective at mm. not letting the populations explode. Hopefully keeping it much closer to the ick exposure they'd have in the ocean. Right. Uh, you know, probably not all the way down there, but certainly much closer than like totally uncontrolled. So I don't know, you know, if there's any reason to actually believe that, that isn't, it isn't actually doing this. And in fact, no. when we asked that same poll in the uh, hashtag Asperger's TV group and on YouTube actually, yeah. I was blown away. You know, we asked like, will UV control uh, fish parasites, dinos, algae, all that kind of stuff, or all of the above? Oh, Dave got it right here. Oh, do you have that one? No, nope. oh no, no, not that, that one. Uh, oh, with the, the we UV question. One. Oh, yep. I got you. And yeah. The, response was like 80% everything. everything. Yeah. I mean, the belief structure on UV has totally changed in the last few years. Mm. Like I was overwhelmed with how permeated that really was. Yeah. Uh, all right, so this is actually, this is a good one. You can bring this up before I get too far into this. This was the poll from, oh, we'll, we'll hit YouTube and then we'll go to Facebook yeah. here. So that one's from Facebook. Uh, hit Dennis here. Uh, Dennis says, Dennis L says, how effective would it be to use a controller to schedule different flow rates during the day to achieve different multiple goals in a UV. This is very interesting. This one we get ca asked constantly because the new conversation is- Proper flow yeah, rate. Yeah, use the two right tool, right job. I'm gonna set up the UV sterilizer for parasites uh, or I'm gonna set it up 
for like bacterial clouds and stuff. And they're just totally different flow rates, totally mm. different contact times. And it's like, well, I got this one tool. I'd like it to do everything. If you try to make it do everything, it will do nothing. Mm. You know, and nothing's probably too strong of a word, but you won't achieve both of your goals. So set it up to do the one thing. If you turn it on for uh, only half the day in each goal, you're only gonna achieve half the goal in, for half the day. Yeah. So like all those, uh, 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 all the ick that ends up hatching it is gonna go during that 12 hours and go land on a fish, mm. you know, or you know, uh, all, whatever other disease. So I, I just wouldn't too. do it. Yeah, eat, pick one. The thing that's most important to you and optimize that or two or two yeah one for each people got two return uh, <coughs> ret return pumps all, all the time these days so that's super easy yeah all right i have chosen jacob here uh, i'll let you just hit this one as well uh so he's talking about him he must be talking about his own system here and mm -hmm. uh, some of the some what if he what he's observed so without uv he's observed like a redox of 350 millivolts uh with with uv 450. so you know, one higher than the other. Yeah, uh, potentially cleaner water. Mm. With UV, slightly, without UV, slightly cloudy water. With UV, perfectly clear, almost too clear. Without UV, a touch of yellow and green. With UV, blue and clear. Without UV, visible copepods. With UV, just as many visible copepods. Uh, someone tell me the reason why running UV is bad, please. I get that on newer tanks, it, it's bad, but for mature tanks, why not? This is that UV shaming again, man. Like mm. it's conversation, and it, it looks like it's like really wrapping up that whole conversation. Like yeah. it doesn't really exist anymore. Like so many positive things, and so this isn't really related related to parasites, but it, you know, because it was part of the UV conversation, I just thought it was interesting. And uh, the one part in the last visible copepods versus just as many visible yeah. copepods. So one There's, of the things that question is asked so many times. Always like, number one question: Doesn't UV sterilizer will it kill my copepod population? No. So we're talking sterilizer is like a 17 watt, you know, 25 watt light bulb that will kill microscopic single cell organisms. And then sterilize yeah. other ones from reproducing. Yeah, well, I wouldn't kill. Yeah, it sterilizes or damages their DNA and prevents them from reproducing. Yeah. A copepod, I can see with my visual eye, amphipod for sure. Yeah. They have like appendages. Uh, this is like a way, way, way more complex organism that is not going to be damaged unless it just decides to live in there. <laughs> uh, yeah. So uh, I've never seen it affect. Back the microfauna population in a tank. Uh, and a majority probably don't even get it in the, in, through there anyway because they're on surfaces, not just free floating all through the water, willy nilly. Yeah. yeah. So that's your answer. Okay. All right. So, Facebook, we're going to answer the poll then. So, you can look at the poll and thought, we'll see what everybody thought here. So, pull that up, Dave. So, this is the poll on Facebook about this topic. Are you practicing this thing, uh, eradication management, or hope for the best? I'm not surprised to see that a, a vast majority are just hoping for the best. Mm. I am surprised to see how many people are practicing ick eradication, uh, and but it's about the same as ick management. But hope for the best by far the uh, like you yeah. know, leader here. So 580 some votes. Hope for the best had 290 some votes. So the other two were split. The the other 300 some were split between ick management and, and ick eradication. Yeah, so I don't know. It was a really interesting result because, I mean, it's roughly, it's not thirds, but uh, like, no. it's pretty broken pretty up close. pretty well, yeah. right? And I, liked, I, I love it that people are willing to raise their hand and just say, I'm not doing My this well. My head's in the sand, heads yeah. In, like, just be real with each other, right? So I, I don't know. I think I love that you know, mm. people being honest. So uh, the first one is uh, one of our super active members, man. It actually has helped us out with a bunch <laughs> of projects as well. So thank you, Harry Singer. Harry what do you Singer. Say? Harry Singer uh, says... Is there a difference between hoping for the best and ick management? To Harry, they're both the same. My response to that was, go read the article, actually. Yeah, it was. Is. And he hadn't read it when, when you answered that. Yeah. So I, I would say for most people, no. Yeah. Right? But if I take a four-prong approach to it and I actually mm. do those things, I don't put fish in there that are magnets, I don't stress out the fish, I feed them well, and I keep the over par overall parasite load low with UV, I would call that ick management and probably other disease and parasite management as well. And I think there's no reason to believe that that won't be way more effective mm. than doing none of those things and putting your head in the sand. I feel like, uh, I feel like there's a progression to get to ick management. All of us, probably, unless you do some super deep reading and research beforehand, uh, you probably were head in the sand and didn't know. 
Uh, and then after, you know, maybe you saw Ick for the first time, or now you, you're, you have your tank set up and you're starting to read about Ick, now you're learning about uh, Ick management. For the lucky ones, who might already be in Ick management before, they're know to, before they even know that they're managing Ick to begin with. Mm -hmm. uh, which, to some degree, uh, I, w I would say that I maybe have stumbled upon that, but probably not really because I ended up losing a whole bunch of fish. But after the catastrophic loss of a bunch of fish, I will now practice ick management for sure. Well, hopefully uh, even eradication, hopefully. maybe maybe mixed together. All right, so one of the cool things about this group too is uh, actually you get to see some of like, I don't know, the superstars or, or uh, <laughs> you know some of the business owners and stuff that are in here too. So uh, Roger from Toons USA, the owner of Toons USA, chimed in with his own experience. So I'll let you read that one. Ah, uh, yeah, Roger says, in my old system, I managed, I managed Ick. I did it so very successfully. However, uh, I did so very successfully, he says. However, when I moved to a new tank, I found out the hard way. I had also managed Velvet, and with the stress of the move, it overwhelmed my system and took out every single fish he had due to the uh, atypical presentation of a very, very slow spread and the tanks succumbing last. I wasted my time assuming that it was uremia or brucinella and using the wrong medications. I've learned that I've learned this actually quite common from maintenance people that they've uh, they've had setups for over five to ten years or more. Do a move or reset, and a parasite that was managed in an established setup now spreads like wildfire. After that experience, I've been fallow for nearly 150 days, and will source all my fish from marine collectors or TSM that do a full quarantine, it simply is not worth the savings or headaches, and apparently my own quarantine methods were inadequate or sloppy. Paying an expert seems like money saved in hindsight. It does, actually. Mm. Uh, so that was a little long, uh, but at the same time, super valuable because, and thanks Roger for sharing your experience here, because, you know, in the end, this is one of the in more interesting concepts for me, is like a lot of people will have you know, bought a dog on Craigslist for cheap, right? And other people will get one you know, from a breeder, known lineage, and mm -hmm. like, you know, like known health standards yeah. and stuff yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. And like, it's been my experience that the breeder pet lasts a lot longer, mm. uh, the, if you get it from one you're well-researched mm. anyway. Uh, it's not always true. Uh, in fact, sometimes you say like uh, the, the mutts of the world are actually genetically healthier. <laughs> but uh, in general, if you're just talking about a pet, you know, getting for somebody who cares about it, right. you know, the, the better. So one of the interesting things here is, so, you know, you've been tracking with us for sure. You already know that I get most of my fish from marine collectors. He quarantines them for a few weeks, treats them proactively. Mm -hmm. There's a big difference. So like, you know, you might look at the website you're buying from, it says quarantined on it. Right. If you go read the fine prints, like, yeah, we looked at it and made sure yeah. that it didn't look like it was dying. Sat in a tank while we were looking at it for 30 days. Yeah. Didn't die in front of us. You know, <laughs> I don't know. They probably didn't even look at it for 30 days, yeah. right? Uh, so, uh, but the problem is, is the difference you'll know for sure between a good quarantine or a thorough proactively treated one or non, is that the proactive one costs a hundred dollars more. Yeah. You know, and so you can spot it right there. And here's the thing, like a lot of you are like, no way, man, I never pay the hundred bucks, right? Here's the thing. Dude, the guy is going to go down there and go down to the wholesalers, look for the healthiest fish he can find, mm. pick that one out for you bring it home, make sure it's eating, proactively treat it with a variety of medications to get rid of flukes and parasites and all this stuff. He's gonna do that every single day, maintaining all the water parameters and medication levels perfectly because he's skilled at it. And he's gonna do that for roughly a month. Uh, that's three bucks a day to yeah. do all of those services for you. Oh yeah. Right, I mean, that, it's a hundred bucks sounds a lot, three bucks a day, like, well, he's like working for free. <laughs> you know, so uh, I don't know. You know, it's uh, you know, you're just gonna pick for yourself. I will say though, if you quarantine at home, it's not free either. No. You know, a lot of times it's gonna cost you 250 bucks or something to set up setup. the system. Yeah. Sometimes you need redundant systems in case one gets contaminated. You can't just put the fish back into the old one. You have to start up a new one yeah, true. immediately. Yeah, true. So you might have to have 500 bucks wrapped up in this. So I can see why Roger would actually consider that. And I'm not sure who he's referring to as TSM. Do you know? No, Maybe somebody out there can chime in who uh, TSM is uh, as an alternative fish, to marine fish collectors. Provider, yeah. uh, but I don't know. Thank you very much, Roger, for sharing that. Yeah, I got awesome. Jeff Schultz here. 
definitely eradication since putting tank transfer method in place. I've never seen any sign of ick on the fish, including my blue tank. So tank transfer method takes advantage of the fact that they fall off the fish. Yeah. And if you uh, move the cycle. fish every few days, uh, you'll just break the cycle and there'll be no uh, ick on the fish. Totally works for ick. Doesn't work for, uh, actually there is a new method for using it on velvet mm. that Humblefish uh, had put together. So you might want to check that out. Oh, yeah. But it doesn't work on every last disease out there. But when he says that uh, I never see any sign of ick on his fish, I know why because he is putting an effective tra tank transfer method in there to, to solve that. Mm. So, Bob here. Bob uh, Ellis, he says, easy enough to eradicate if you do some homework. And this, the, the information's out there, yeah. Uh, I, probably the best one, that Humble Fish article that we've, we've found. Yeah. So. so the only thing that I would say that is, makes it hard, almost anything in reefing is actually easy. It's, you know, assembling the information in a way that, like, I'm confident in doing what I'm doing. I have the answers for when this thing goes wrong, what do mm -hmm. I do? And, you know, the only thing I see in the, like, you know, disease management community mm -hmm. is a lot of kind of iffy statements. You know, I, like, people aren't really willing Could to, like... Could do this, yeah. might happen to treat this. ick, there's, here's yeah. the 15 ways to treat ick. And what we don't see a lot of, of, yeah, there's 15 ways, but this way works you know, the best 80% of the time, or never be scared of the word best, you know, because it just mm. gets debated for everything. But like, how about when it comes down to me, and I've been doing this a long time, this is what I do, Yeah. right? Uh, and they do a lot of research. And so for the pros out there, I think it'd be super helpful to yeah share all the different methods, but in the end, tell them, yeah, well, this is what I do at home. Yep. Right? Because that's what everybody watching this actually wants to do. Direct is advice. do what you do. Yeah. Right? <laughs> like, they don't necessarily want to know every uh, yeah, yeah. Or I would say the 80-20. You know, 80% of the people just want to do what you want to do. The other 20 want to research every method yeah. and kind of figure do, one do out mad their scientist, own. Yeah. You know? uh, and not every method works in every case, and that's kind of why you don't want to get tied down. But what we can do, you know, is work with uh, some of the thought leaders and develop a couple of like small videos. You know, I bet you in 10 minutes we can show you exactly how to do this in a way that works 80% of the time uh, mm. and is just real direct. And you say 80%, well, oh, you're gonna fail 20. Well, right now, man, like almost everybody's failing because it's too hard. Yeah. So we can up our game by hitting that 80, 20 and then perfect from there, right? So that's my goal here. Hopefully we'll do that in the near future. <laughs> Uh, all right, so Kyle, in my current system management, I have no signs of infection, but I'm sure with a major event, it would pop up in any future build eradication, all right? Mm -hmm. So that's probably a lot of you listening, like, I'm not going to go to the tank I have already, you know, because that's going to be too much work. But by planning for it in the future, yeah. hopefully we'll get you the information to be able to do that easy. Yeah, I mean, everybody eventually is going to upgrade or start a new tank or something like that. I've gone through multiples before almost everybody doesn't stick with their very first one, in which case gives us an opportunity as, to learn and uh, hook up a whole new system. I think it's a cool part of the hobby. Like when I had multiple tank syndrome and I had like five, six tanks between the basement and upstairs and what have you, my next step, had I been living in the same area, uh, would have been some kind of quarantining system. So multiple types of tanks, you know, this, this really cool setup. It's just another cool avenue of the hobby you can explore. Like you're not watching a display here, you're actually doing something with the purpose of treating fish. Most of you out there are not doing reef tanks because they're easy. You're actually <laughs> doing it because it's fun and challenging, yeah. right? And so when you evolve a tank and you do a tank upgrade or whatnot, I don't do it just because I want a bigger tank. Mm. Usually I want to do it better, right? I'm an evolving my like skill set and right. my level. Right, right, like right. one of the final frontiers here for sure is disease management. You are essentially now becoming a fish veterinarian. True. Right? So if you can quarantine uh, organisms properly and save their and improve their health, as well as recognize the signs of what's actually harming them and then know what to treat for, the definition of like f fish veterinarian. If you can <laughs> share that information with others like Humblefish does, Man, you are just giving a gift to the community yeah, and yeah. such. So, like that guy's been doing this for ages, right? So, just you know, again, I say this a lot, but like, there's a lot of people out there in a lot of different hobbies where you know they hoard, hoard all knowledge. The knowledge. It's yeah. what makes me special. Like, I'll never give you out my super perfect recipe for ribs or whatever, right? And never, <laughs> you'll never know. But in this industry or hobby, man, we see a lot of people that 
just want to share knowledge mm. and help other people. And you know, I, I don't know, I think this is just one of the best examples possible with Humble Fish. So. Awesome. All right, next one. Uh, Jordan Bernstein says, I feel like they end up being the same thing, ick management and the ick eradication. Uh, you hope for total eradication, but end up managing it, even if that means repeating the whole thing over again. So there's two pieces here. Okay. One, you did it poorly. If, yeah, if, you're, if, you, if, if you didn't eradicate it, then it was just meant poor management. It, well, if you're not effective was, at eradicate, it wasn't eradication. And was, you're going to have to go back to management <laughs> or start it again. Or start it again. Right. Yeah, but hopefully you learn something about it the first, if it does show up. So I, I attempted ick eradication. I got through this process, didn't see ick. I put fish back in my tank, and the next thing I know, I've got ick again. Okay, so what did I do that first round that uh, didn't eradicate it and then learn from that and try again? So here's the thing, man, is uh, if you're gonna do this at home, especially if this is your first time, the reality is, is you're gonna wanna do both. Like, you did proper rick eradication, but like, now that I know better, am I really not gonna feed them properly? You know, true. like, yeah, I, I don't know, you know. You can decide whether or not you want, if, if you're super confident you did it right, the UV is probably unnecessary. Uh, but like, am I gonna create act stress on them? I am willing now to definitely add fish like uh, powder blues and browns oh, and, yeah. and uh, Achilles. Yeah. Like, I've gotten tons of those fish from, uh, I shouldn't say tons, but there's Several. quite a few tanks here from that have gotten collectors. those types of tanks, or, or fish from marine collectors. Not one of them got sick. No, we have, the, we have the Achilles and a powder brown and a powder blue all in that uh, 750XXL. Mm -hmm. None of them ever showed signs of distress or stress or anything. Yeah, so I just like, if you do it right, I'm I, I just not even concerned actually, because you have treated for the disease in there. But the reality is a lot of you are actually gonna do both. You know, you're gonna do eradication and then mm -hmm. you're also gonna back that up with like just good husbandry and yeah. uh, good feeding and whatnot, right? Mm -hmm. So here's the thing though, uh, this is an interesting one. People have asked me this because for sure, my tank at home, which uh, by the way is going to do uh, on the 24th, they're going to install it at my house. Oh yeah. And they're finally going to move it there. Uh, snow's gone. It's now mud though. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, so the question is, is like, well, what are you going to do right? I'm going to get my fish from, from marine collectors, right? I just, he's going to select me a healthy fish. He's going to make sure that they're mm. treated properly. He's going to do it better than I would do it at home, even though I'm, we're going to share his exact methods with you and it should right. be easy. Right. Uh, like I just no, I don't have the space for quarantine systems in my house and stuff. I got two kids running around. I don't want a bunch of meds and, you know, I don't want things like, uh, uh, the embalming fluid, what is that? The formaldehyde. The, the formaldehyde, yeah. you know, products in my house. You know, I just don't want all that stuff there. So he's gonna do that for me. So do you need UV if you got a pro doing it? Yeah. And the reality is, I actually am on the fence, right? On whether or not. Yeah. If I just had some low cost fish, I, I probably wouldn't. I just trust that he had it. You know, did it perfect, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. However. Uh, the UV in comparison to the cost of the fish that's going in this tank uh, is insignificant, <laughs> right? And so, like, I, right. I'm definitely going to put a UV on here as a final protectant because mm. everyone is human, you know, like a single drop of water could jump from one thing to the other. And I haven't had any problems, in fact, all success that I, that would glowingly support, you know, all of you guys using them as well as myself, but, or hopefully uh, Roger's uh, TSM here. But uh, I'm, in fact, I bet you're gonna see a lot of this. As people evolve over the next 10 years, mm. you're gonna see a lot of people evolving the game here and wanting healthier pets and more availability because I don't want to quarantine at home. So I bet you're gonna see dozens of options out there that will go take those fish that have gone through the normal, you know, wholesale things and then you know, turn them into super healthy specimens for you. So yeah. I think you're gonna see that. Uh, what's the next one? Uh, Jim Turner. Jim says after losing 99% of livestock twice, one of the times losing all the coral, I'm strictly working on eradication standards going forward. That's how it works, right? You fail, you fail, you fail, <laughs> and then you're like, I relent, I relent, I'll do it right yeah, this time. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's actually the uh, cost of the treatment uh, it no, is no longer worse than the disease, right? Yeah. So if the disease isn't really harming you, like why would you try to treat it? Especially to learn that lesson twice. Yeah, but you wipe out every one of your pets in the tank twice. Mm. Yeah, now of course, right? So uh, thanks for sharing that. I'm sure it's hard to hear that and like to do it, but we, a lot of people have been through it. Oh yeah. And so, you know, you, 
sharing that helps everybody reminds them that like I don't have to be that person. I get to do it, and it doesn't have to be like crazy. You don't have to go out and buy a necessarily a UV sterilizer and do all this stuff. There's simple things like just feeding them properly. It will make leaps and bounds, man. Uh, all right, so uh, Clayton Mantell. I think proper feeding is one of the most overlooked keys to ick prevention. People use the same container of old, stale, dry food, feed stingily every two days, and then wonder why their fish are prone to disease. Mm. Okay, so what we're doing is like, you know, playing whack-a-mole here. So when I started the hobby, the problem was actually algae and stuff. Now there's right. so many solutions for algae, yeah, it's yeah, ridiculous, yeah. right? This is, algae is not, well, should never be the reason you shut down a tank at this point. Right? There's mm -hmm. way too many solutions that are easy to do. But now that that's not a problem, like... Uh, I can now feed my fish properly? Yeah, yeah. I, I, absolutely. That, that's what got me down the, the path of uh, a sterile tank environment where there was no, I mean, zero nitrates and phosphates and wondering why my corals weren't looking so healthy. Uh, because I got so scared of nitrates and phosphates that I would just feed only enough to keep the fish alive uh, and then wonder why nothing was happening in the tank. And for them, uh, probably why that whole tank crashed when I added a, uh, a clown tank in that had the slightest bit of disease on him, lost all everything. So there's other conversations in here like, I don't know, Anthea's just die. No, they don't. They don't. It's not true. Yeah. Right? Like, like chromis, they just die. They just dwindle over time, right? These are super active fish. They're swimming all over, all over, and you're feeding them a couple of pellets every other day. Yeah. You're not giving them enough energy, you know, and they're just susceptible to all kinds of problems mm. from malnutrition, mm. right? And so I see tanks where they overfeed. You know, like I don't know if overfeed's the right word, but they feed all the time. Those antheas, chromis, do not dwindle. End of story. Yeah. yeah. And so I see that all over the over the place with different things. And so when we just shrug our shoulders, like. I don't think it's just too easy to write off the fact, oh, those things just die. Right. No, like go looking for the reasons and at least t attempt to, you know, fix that. And attempt to share information with others so they can fix it too. Because when we just share that information, oh, they just die. We're, you know, encouraging everybody to just kill their fish. You know, <laughs> yeah, and like we're creating a scenario where that's just okay. Yeah, no. Uh, and if, if it's three dollars worth of fish food a month that we can change uh, that whole conversation, spend the three bucks. Spend the three bucks. You know, it's, it's nothing, you know, in comparison mm. to what we got into this thing. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't know. Uh, next one. Uh, Justin Kane says, I don't know, man. I've, I never QT my fish. I've had multiple tanks. I feed several times a day. Uh, they had ick once years ago. Since then, I've never seen so much as a spot. Raise your hand if uh, that's you. That because was me. Uh, that's been almost everybody at one yeah. point. Yeah. Like, you feel like it's going well. Yeah. Until it doesn't. Until it doesn't. Yeah. It's just a, a, kind of a ticking time bomb. And, and most of it, I think we hit on this already, so I won't, I won't dwell on it, mm -hmm. but most of it's like some, uh, you know, catastrophic event that happens in the tank. Like right. The heater breaks, overheats, underheats, you know, power outage for, you know, a day, all kinds of different things that can happen. That is where the strategy of like, I don't know, it just seems like it's been working out okay for me. That's where it starts to go south. Yeah. Not every time, but a lot of times that's where it happens. All right, next one. Uh, Kyle SP, I don't worry about ick. I worry about velvet. Unlike ick, it will destroy your tank. Thankfully, treating for velvet also treats for ick. This is actually a good one. And one of the things we're going to teach in the, in the quarantine episodes is when you do the quarantine, you're not actually just treating for ick. You're treating for velvet, ick, flukes, mm -hmm. all kinds of different mm -hmm. things. And some of them just kind of cross over to each other. So the same treatment works on other stuff. Right. Uh, and so, yeah. You, and, and also the velvet, for those of you who don't know, I think uh, I was reading again Humble Fish's stuff here. Uh, it's hard to tell the difference between ick and velvet, other than if you see velvet, your fish are probably dead. It's probably too late, unless you're like really good at this and experienced, mm -hmm. you know, which hopefully will get you to the point that you ah. are. Uh, but the difference often with ick is if I can count the white dots, it's ick. If I can't count the white dots, uh, it's probably velvet, yeah, right? Yeah. Uh, and so velvet takes over really fast and, and kills the fish super quick. Uh, so, but anyway, I, you know, I, I appreciate Kyle's opinion here that like it actually isn't the problem in many cases. It's some of the other diseases. But like Roger, Roger thought that he didn't have velvet in his tank, and he did. It was just managed through yeah. good husbandry yeah. and diet. And then next thing you know, he changed. He moved. Rears its ugly head. Stressful event such as moving the tank, everything dies. Huh. Yeah. So, uh, all right, Brendan, uh, man, did I want to pick ick management? 
or Brendan Doherty. A man that I want to pick ick management, but if I'm really being honest with myself, I feed well, keep the tank clean, and just hope for the best, right? That's a lot of us, right? <laughs> but you know what? You're already ab above the game, man, because yeah. you feed well, keep the tank clean, and hope for the best. So, right? yeah, to some degree, it's incidental ick, ick management. At the same time, when it does pop up, I don't freak out, and I just keep up my husbandry, so I guess that counts as managing it. Yep. Just like the last few live week streams, it depends, or at least for me, it depends. It depends. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Yeah. All right, so James Smith here. Yeah, James Smith says, I've always been a QT when convenient and ick management when it shows up. A recent round of ick popped up and wiped out half of the fish, including two clownfish that he's had for five years. Uh, and covered his gem tang. Luckily, the gem did good in a QT with copper for a few weeks, along with most of what was left. Now he's 100% QT, no exceptions, going into his upcoming 300. Again, the evolution. Uh, it's, uh, we all start in the same place, and depending on our experiences, kind of progress along. Yeah. Right? All right, so we'll answer some of the questions here. Glenn Rudolph's up there to begin with. Glenn, he says, treat it like you treat COVID. <laughs> Quarantine or deal with it. And if you're already sick, uh, when you get ick, good luck. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, COVID is definitely top of mind at the moment. But yeah, uh, you, you have to treat it and deal with it. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, what's the next one? Uh, Red Porter says, all about that overpowered UV. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure I need overpowered, but overpowered won't hurt anything. Yeah. Uh, but it comes with, uh, hurts your wall though a little more. Okay, so, uh, but we shared this, maybe some of you didn't see it, but uh, mm -hmm. we had, uh, it did the five minute tank guide, right? And those two tanks were not, you know, quarantine fish, because we were just doing what the average person does right. with a brand new tank like that, uh, and sharing that path. And it worked in the 40 breeder, right? Yeah, all the fish did. were just fine. They were fine. Yep. Hope and and pray. in the E170, uh, almost all the fish died uh, of disease. So, however, the, yeah, this is one of the things that like we're all a product of anecdotal experiences to some degree, right? Right. This is one of the anecdotal experiences for me that kind of changed my mind. Every t fish in there died. The yellow tang was looking terrible, like it was on its deathbed. Mm. We put the UV on, and all of a sudden now the yellow tang is just fine. <laughs> Something that we also saw actually in the UV test tanks. Uh, oh, that's true. You know, very similar stuff. Yeah, we had the, the we were testing for U algae and mm -hmm. things like that. Uh, then we decided to, uh, well, we shut off the UV sterilizers because the experiment was over. And then somehow the fish that were in the tanks where we had borrowed live rock from a, a well-established system and who knows where the live rock came from, looked like they developed like velvet. Mm -hmm. I thought it was velvet. It could have been ick. Could have been ick, yeah. Uh, but we... Uh, thought they were goners. Uh, they, but it was only in the tanks that uh, had the UV shut off, the high and low flow UV. It was, a, it was an interesting scenario, yeah. Some of the tanks that never had UV mm -hmm. developed it and some of them died. And there were some of them where they turn, we turned the UV off and uh, all of a sudden they, they developed, developed the it. symptoms, turned yeah. it back on, the symptoms went away. The tanks so, that we never shut the UV off of, we didn't oh, see Oh yeah, it. those ones were just healthy. Mm. So I mean, these are all anecdotal experiences, but like, this is the thing where you're like, you know, people say, well, it won't help you treat you know, a, a, a current problem. Well, why? Mm. And then uh, when I see it actually working, like, and here's the problem with that statement actually is, it won't help you if you're gonna order it today and like ship it ground and then install it three weeks from now is probably too late. <laughs> so that is true. I mean, we happen to have this stuff around that can implement it on, on site, you know, or in those cases, just turn it back on. Might not help if they're already laying down oh, yeah, on their like, deathbed and you're hoping that you recover. If they're flopping around the bottom, it's too late. Yeah. But, you know, if you're just showing signs of, of ick and stuff uh, and they're not like actually dying, they're just kind of scratching on the rocks and mm -hmm. whatever, like, you could probably, you know, just lower all that. It'll probably take a couple of weeks while all the parasites that are currently attacking the fish fall off. But you can reduce the overload, uh, the overall load after that. So I don't know. That's my kind of anecdotal experiences, and I would actually treat that way based because it seems to be working for me. Yeah. All right. Uh, Dev says, "What does it take to eliminate ick in an established tank?" And I think Humblefish opened it up in that uh, the top of his article where he says uh, a fallow period, 76 days. So you take your fish out and your tank is a, just the life cycle of the ick 
Uh, it's like that 76 days, and me personally, if I was doing 76 days, I'd probably just go 80 just, just because. Yeah, in fact, uh, so 76 days is generally accepted as enough. Uh, mm. But there's some rare instances where it could go longer. Yeah. Uh, and so if it were me and I was really trying to do this, again, you can't treat in the tank. There's nothing out there that will do no. that. Don't listen to anybody that says it. A yeah, reef safe uh, treat, uh, uh, tank treatment. Yeah. There's nobody like that I look to as a thought leader to me that would tell you there's a reputable source that to treat it in the tank, mm. you know, with corals in it, I should say. So uh, I would, if you wanted to do this, you'd remove all of the fish. Mm -hmm. You would quarantine them properly. You know, if it was just ick, you could do the tank transfer method, but I would probably recommend like a medicated uh, approach that mm -hmm. we'll, we'll share in the upcoming weeks. Uh, and, you know, leave the tank empty. For me, if I'm gonna go 78 days, I might as well go 100. Right. You know, what does it make, what does it make difference? You know, and then I just, you know, peace of mind, because I don't want to do it again. Yeah. Right. I certainly don't want to do right. it again. Right. Right. So uh, that's what it would take. Next uh, one. I wanted to hit this one from Michael Rolfs that just popped up. Not that. The, yeah, that one there. He says, uh, if UV kills 99, 999 out of a thousand free swimmers and the single free swimmer infects your tank, it still has ick. It's true. And that's the uh, that. That's the point we're trying to get across to, is that UV isn't the cure, like adding it to my tank will cure, will cure the ick, uh, but it will help manage it. So the big piece here is how many parasites are actively attacking the fish, mm. right? So in this uh, analogy here, 999, if it kills 999, there were a thousand that could go actively catch the, or uh, 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 parasites that could go actively attack the fish. Now we've reduced it to one, which will probably happen. It might still you just won't the see fish. any you yeah. know visual signs uh, of the parasite attacking the fish. It'll probably be in its gills, and you probably just won't see it. Uh, but what we'll have is a tank that appears to be healthy. It's not a uh, one you know perfect solution, but you know if we can help the pet or uh, like and boost its immune system through diet and husbandry. We can reduce the amount of parasites because the same thing actually here can be said about the ocean. Yeah. The ick it lives in the ocean. And they're exposed to this all the time. It's just managed to yeah. a point where it's not killing all of the fish. It's just at a low, way lower density. Right. So if we can acknowledge the reason that the fish aren't just all dying in the ocean because it's a way lower density, why wouldn't we want a lower density or population of stuff mm, in the aquarium yeah. as well? So I think that, like, when we talk a lot about, like, will it eradicate ick from the tank? 100% no. It will never, ever, 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 ever do that. If anybody tells you that it will, they're either wrong or lying. One or the other. <laughs> okay. uh, so, but what we're really getting at here is can it reduce the populations, which means reduce the number of parasites attacking the fish? Yes. Mm. All right. Uh, Jose says, uh, if, if you, what if the LFS you get your fish from use copper on their fish tanks? Do we still quarantine? I mean, this all goes 100% to how much you trust uh, the, the store that you're buying from. I'd ask them questions about like, how do they maintain the levels? Because if it falls like just for one day, you have mm. to start the whole process over again. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and like, is it just copper? Because actually we're treating for flukes and intestinal stuff right. and all kinds of other things are super common. There's a spectrum yeah. of, of treatments out there. So yeah. if you're only treating for one, it might have, have the possibility of having something else. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's hard for a store, you know, because you got so many pets coming in and out, oh, you true. know, and for what, for what they do. But, like, if it were me, I would have an area of my store that is like Marine Collector Corner, right? Mm. Like, these ones went through a month-long quarantine protocol, and they're guaranteed free of all these things. Mm. I know that everybody doesn't want to pay for them, right? That's fine. But for the people that do, here it is, right? Uh, and a lot of stores do run quarantine just to try to keep uh, the pets alive. And yeah. so I don't know the answer to that question completely, uh, but uh, I would, in many cases, I mean, this is a debatable one, and I'd be interested to hear what other people think. But for me, I prefer to at least get my fish from somewhere that has treated with copper. But for that to really be effective, it, it'd have to have lived in there for weeks at a time mm -hmm. and probably, you know, controlled perfectly. Yeah. All right. 
A uh, couple donations here. Glenn Rudolph and Woo Woo's Reef. Nine, oh. uh, ten bucks from, or five bucks from Glenn. All in oh. favor of uh, live Starbucks. chat every day. Thank you very much. And then Woo Woo's Reef. Nine, uh, ten bucks for Starbucks. Appreciate Sweet. you. Uh, Michael Rolfs, again, uh, who brought up the last one, he says, uh, non-fish uh, need to be quarantined for a minimum of 30 days in a fishless system to be 100% sure, uh, 76 days in a fishless system. So we're he's talking mm. about uh, like invertebrates and things like that? Yeah, oh, so uh, really, man, you should quarantine your fish, your snails, corals, your possibly, corals yeah. anything that comes in a bag of water. Uh, should be quarantined in its own system. This is where stuff gets really complex and you just kind of do your best. Yeah. And where like a lot of people will relent and just say, all right, well, I'm just going to practice management, ick management mm. because I don't have the ability to do this perfect and I just relent. But that's cool, man, because if you practice ick management and hit those four prongs well, you're probably doing this better than 80% of the reefers out mm. there. Right, so like, be proud of that. Like, I, I acknowledge, I took my head out of the sand, I'm doing the four things now, and I got <laughs> this thing covered. Uh, Aaron Jackson, uh, I've got a white spot, uh, I've got a white spot in my DT, but only one fish has it. So, uh, I'd share a picture of that, maybe on hashtag Aspirus TV, yeah, and ask people what it is, because sometimes it's not what you think it is. Yeah. Uh, I know there's those, that disease that ends up on the little fins and stuff, that's just something that comes and goes. It mm. looks gross, but it can actually hurt. Stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't know, I would I would look, but I wouldn't I wouldn't get bent out of shape I mean, is it probably Is it safe to assume, you see, you see this comment from people all the time, is it safe to just say, like, if you haven't practiced perfect to ick eradication, you should just assume that ick is going is in your tank. Yeah, you should. And then, and then just manage it. Now manage it to the best of your ability. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Blue Antic says, if I run two UVs, should I run them in series or one per return? Uh, well, you couldn't run them in series because you need to run them at different flow rates. Yeah. Right. So if you want to do it two purpose, you know, in this case, I. If people ask, I guess, a lot, man. Should you run one for, should I, if I could only run for one, should I run for algae and bacteria yeah. and, you know, dinos and all that kind of stuff? Or should I protect my fish? And it kind of depends on how much effort you went through with your fish. Like, in my case, mm -hmm. if I was only going to run one and I was getting all my fish from Elliot and marine collectors. Your algae. I'm probably going to run for algae yeah. and dinos and all that stuff. And again, I, what I really want to do is run it as an ounce of prevention so I don't ever have to deal with that stuff, or at least I reduce the chances of dealing with all that stuff. But if you're going to run two UVs, you need to have them uh, off of two mm. pumps, that preferably two different return pumps, and run them at the right speed. Uh, Tony Close... You, uh, UK Reef, he says, hi, do all tanks have ick to start with or is it introduced? I think it's just safe to assume that any tank that has a half dozen to a dozen fish or even maybe a few. I mean, see, here's the thing. If you don't know, if you've seen how the fish come in, then you, you would assume they all have it. Mm. So if you go to the fish wholesalers and you see like, it's not like any of these people are bad, by the way. It's just reality. Right. You know, the fish come in from the ocean. They enter a system where other fish are in, you know, mm. and they've all been exposed to each other. They're all stressed out because they, you know, used to live in Fiji, and now they live in a plastic box, you yeah. know? And so uh, it's just reality that you should, it's probably safe to assume they have some type of disease, whether it's ick, I don't know, but likely that they have something uh, on them. Uh, you're better to say, safer to assume they do than don't. Uh, let's see, we got 10 bucks from Wolfman Jack. Appreciate you. Oh, thank you, you. very much. Uh, I don't know, I'd like to, oh, maybe we should talk to John's here. John's Reef, uh, it's in the pending comments. Okay. Uh, he just says, ick management is utter BS. <laughs> people, people, let me get the whole thing put up here. Uh, people who don't want to move corals or fish are lazy. I moved 70 plus corals in my 135 gallon to another smaller tank to treat the main tank with hypo. Pure laziness. I mean, I don't know. I'm, I'm going to be straight up, John. Uh, this one is that like uh, tank shaming thing for me. Okay. Right? You're doing it the right way, man. You have every right to be proud of what you're doing. Oh, yeah. Right? So, That's a lot of effort. Man, hold your head high, man, because you're taking care of your pets properly. Yeah. 
right? But acknowledge, man, that you were probably not that person the first year you started reefing, right? Uh, and there's a journey to getting there. And so there's an easier way to say that statement, which is like, man, this is the best solution and I'll help you get there if yeah. you wanna know. Uh, well, this is what works for me. But pure laziness, I'm not, I think this is a little harsh, <laughs> right? So I don't know, I, I, I get where you're getting at, man, and you should hold your head proud, high, man, proud. Uh, and, and if you can, man, help other people achieve the same success you have. Put more effort into it than I w than I had earlier in my in my career. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Uh, Andrew Shores, uh, would you guys say small fish are more susceptible to ick than bigger fish? No, not at all. Uh, actually, even maybe even the, maybe not the opposite, but it looks like those like those tangs, those acanthurus tangs or acanthurus tangs. Uh, seem to be, and they get very large, seem to be very susceptible to it. I think it's more related to mucus coat than size. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and how easily they're stressed yeah. as well. Sasha2322, uh, what about if the tangs are, are tank bred, does that help or uh, doesn't really make a difference okay. of the chances of ick? So this depends on where you're buying from, but my personal belief hmm. is that in most cases, if you're breeding fish like that, you would not be very successful uh, if you had uh, active parasites in the tank. Mm. So to be able to be effective uh, breeder in a closed environment with high density uh, fish in there, you almost certainly have effectively er eradicated oh, yeah. it out. Yeah. yeah, and so I'm gonna say the same thing, and not in every case, but in many cases for corals too, when you buy you know, captive bred things, there just isn't the same like, risk of pests. There is a risk of pests, depending on where you got them from, but it isn't the same as getting it from the wild yeah, and, and going into a holding vat that has eight million things in it. Oh yeah. Uh, but, so is it a good move? I think so. Is it uh, like a sure fire sign that you won't ever get anything? If you get it direct, also this is a big thing too. You have to get that uh, tank bred fish from the actual producer. I if, walk to their yeah. house, I grab it, or their facility, <laughs> I grab it, I put it in a bag, and I take it back. Or they ship it to you. Or but they ship if, it to you. you know, like, uh, like say ORA, you know, shipped it to a store or to somebody else, the moment it touched the store or the online shop or whatever, Soon. tank, done. Yeah, so assume that it might be effective. If ORA shipped it direct to you, I would say really high confidence, man, that I'm probably not gonna have disease but not absolute. Right. Uh, a couple more here. Uh, Eric Alexis says, should I run UV sterilizers all the time? The answer is 100% yes. Yes. If you're gonna run it, it needs to be run 24 seven for it to be effective. Otherwise it's a uh, total waste. I, I, cool. wouldn't even, I wouldn't even buy it if I planned on running it less. Yeah. Uh, John's Reef, last one here. I'm only uh, one and one and a half years into reefing. I uh, just tried ick management. It, it didn't work, and he lost or $800 in fish. So, John, I'd be super curious here to hear, like, uh, how, you know, how well was the approach applied to ick management? Because ick management obviously can fail. Right, and you're just doing management, and then like even humble fish was talking about you know after 30 years, 30 years, you know, of it's just like you're just waiting for an event to happen, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, depending on how much you've implemented, that's how likelihood that event's going to happen. But no, that's uh, that's it. Where are we at for next week? All right, so next week, uh, may I let you share the question? Yeah, uh, we posted in the description right now. You can go to Facebook, you can go to the community tab on YouTube, and cast your votes. We're talking about coral feeding. Mm -hmm. So next, uh, next week, we want to know your thoughts on coral feeding, whether you do it, whether you don't do it, whether you know you could do it and it might benefit, but you don't do it, or uh, whether you kind of let you know, the tank run itself and corals feed themselves. So I'm going to tell you right now that uh, I'm going to shoot a little live, but the tank behind us, we started doing some more feeding with specific coral foods. Ooh, I'm going to yeah. show you right like live like what the difference is yeah. so I, I, I might do that in my facebook account uh, in the in the group a facebook group later live yeah, so cool even today Check that I think. Out. but I, when i started this hobby everybody kind of like said that coral foods are a waste of time they can get everything from photosynthesis and i do think that it's true they can get like all or most or whatever yeah. like, they, they're gonna live yeah but living isn't actually the standard I want anymore. No, I thriving. want thriving, yeah. fast growing, healthy, you know, uh, able to withstand some of the bumps that I'm gonna run into, mm. best coloration, all that kind of stuff. 
And uh, you know, this is actually, I should share this earlier, mm. is if you're waiting to only things use things you can absolutely prove 100% actually work, you're just missing so much opportunity in this mm. hobby. So you should look for those things and then just try your own experiment or experiments at home. Try out different things. Have a desired goal. I don't want to just dump aminos in and just keep doing it because somebody told me. Yeah. I want to see an actual I want to result. see some results. And if I do, I'll keep doing it. If I don't, I won't. You know, but try like, some stuff. Out. You know, if you just rule it out to only things that 100% universally agreed on, well, that really, we're not going to know all that stuff ever. You know, so it just takes so much fun stuff off of the table yeah. uh, and progress off of the table. And really, this hobby is 100%, you know, not 100%, but almost 100% learns actually anecdotally together. Yeah. So it's our experiences together that do that. So we're going to ask you guys, I want you to share the foods that you use, hopefully share some pictures, you know, like before and after, if possible, you know, on yeah. anything you might have. And, you know, share your experiences with each other. What foods uh, did do a result, which ones didn't, which one maybe caused a problem. But uh, answer. Maybe don't use it at all and never would. Answer that, too, because it's just as valuable. So we'll uh, see you next week. Yeah. All right. See you then.